Welcome to Carbon Connection, the podcast bringing you the latest insights from the front lines of climate action. I'm Lauren Knappuck with the Climate Action Reserve, and together we'll hear from industry leaders driving real progress against climate change and explore the ever-evolving world of carbon markets and climate policy. Thanks for joining, and let's get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Carbon Connection. In this episode, we'll be diving into an important hot topic within the climate and carbon market community right now, scope three emissions and how to account for them. Scope three emissions can be seen as the most complex and wide reaching category of greenhouse gas emissions for organizations. And therefore addressing them is an important piece of tackling global emissions and achieving climate goals through corporate action. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Marielle Cantor Weigel, Senior Director of Global Climate Solutions at Conservation International, the organization that helps communities, companies, and governments invest in nature for their own well being and so that people everywhere in our planet can thrive. Marielle leads the Corporate Climate Solutions team, which is responsible for guiding the governance and tracking the impact of the organization's portfolio of natural climate solutions commitments, including carbon crediting. Marielle joined Conservation International in 2002 and previously led its Responsible Mining and Energy Program, and prior to that, its strategy to engage the private sector on freshwater conservation. It's fantastic to have Marielle on with us as we discover the opportunities and challenges associated with using carbon credits for Scope 3 and discuss how their inclusion fits into broader sustainability strategies. Marielle, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Lauren. And we really appreciate this opportunity to talk more about our work on climate change and this really important topic, Scope 3 emissions. I thought it might be helpful just as a, a little bit of a further introduction to CI to talk for a minute about how we think about the climate change issue. You mentioned our mission, and it's really simple. We're focused on the recognition that people need nature to thrive. And so around the world, we're really working to improve the lives of people by protecting our oceans, forests, and other living ecosystems. And we do this because the science tells us that a healthy planet, including a stable climate, underpins all life on Earth. So the role that nature can play in helping us to mitigate and adapt to climate change is really a top strategic priority for Conservation International. And wherever we work around the world, which is mainly in the global south, we partner with governments, indigenous peoples and local communities and the private sector to implement and scale the impact of our conservation work. So that's why we're really interested in this, the scope three topic and the opportunity that it presents for the private sector to address climate change. Thank you so much, Marielle. That was such a fantastic introduction for everyone on Conservation International and your mission and it's important that we have you on today because you work very closely with the private sector who is navigating this challenge right now around scope three. And to jump in, can you explain the significance of scope three emissions in a company's overall greenhouse gas inventory? Sure, happy to. And to start, it might be helpful with a few basic definitions. The greenhouse gas protocol, which is considered one of the preeminent greenhouse gas accounting standards, classifies greenhouse gas emissions into three categories or scopes. And that really helps organizations to understand and manage their emissions. So scope one are direct emissions from sources that a company might own or directly control. So a good example of that would be a company's vehicles and or on-site fuel combustion. Scope two emissions are indirect, but specifically focused on the generation of purchased electricity and other things like that. So these emissions occur off-site often, not in direct control of a company, but they're attributed specifically to that company's use of energy. So that brings us to scope three. That's all of the other indirect emissions that occur in a company's value chain. So 
This includes emissions from both what we would call upstream activities, like production of purchased goods and services, but also downstream activities like the use of sold products. So sometimes we refer to these upstream activities as a company's supply chain. So, you know, whereas scope one is all about direct emissions, scope two is all about emissions from energy, scope three covers all upstream and downstream activities that aren't directly within a company's control. And that control issue becomes important because it makes it a bit more challenging. So upstream activities on the supply chain side for companies hosts 26 times the emissions than those that sit within scopes one and two. So it's a very significant category of emissions for companies. And thus, you know, one of the reasons why it's so important. I thought it might be helpful to give a few examples of how scope three emissions relate to an organization's greenhouse gas footprint. So to take one example for, let's say, a company buying beef, maybe a quick service restaurant or a grocery retailer, their scope free emissions for purchase goods and services would cover everything all the way back to the land use change for producing soy that beef or cattle eats, as an example, uh, along with a number of other dimensions of that. So for a company producing things, this will usually be the largest part of their footprint. Just to give another quick example, because Conservation International has also been looking at and defining ways to address our own organizational emissions, we're a global organization with about 1,700 employees and work in over 30 countries. Unlike many companies, though, we don't make things, but we do implement projects around the world that really require us to travel quite a bit to those places that we work. And so in recent years, in measurement of our emissions, travel has made nearly two-thirds of our overall organizational emissions. And those are all in what we would call this scope three category. So, you know, despite this disproportionate scale or significance of scope three emissions, these supply chain emissions uh, and value chain emissions continue to be overlooked by companies. So companies are twice as likely to measure their scope one and two emissions uh, as opposed to scope three emissions and almost two and a half times more likely to set targets for those scope one and two emissions versus scope three. So it's a huge space that is very significant in terms of global emissions and is one that we really want to be working with companies to help address. Thank you so much, Mariel. That was really such a fantastic overview in setting the scene of scope one, two, and three emissions and why it's so important to be tackling scope three emissions. And I appreciate the examples that you've given externally, as well as how Conservation International is looking at their own scope three emissions, as you've nodded that it can look very different depending on what kind of organization you are, where you are in the world. And it's important to be taking this step back to see how we address our supply chains and, and tackle scope three. So I really appreciate you walking us through that. And as you've mentioned, scope three often involves a company's entire value chain, which in itself makes it complex to address. So I'm wondering if you can share what challenges you see companies facing in measuring and addressing their scope three emissions. Sure. Happy to dive in on that. I would say, well, it's a complicated space. There are a number of issues, but I'd like to focus on three. One is data collection. So in order to be able to measure one's footprints, it requires collecting data. And the data required to calculate greenhouse gas emissions cuts across just about every facet of a company's business and therefore can be quite challenging to consolidate. We know this ourselves at Conservation International from our own internal greenhouse gas footprint accounting. Particularly for scope three, this is an issue because it's not always activities directly in a company's control, but rather often emissions from those entities in your supply chain or in the downstream use of, of products. So that data collection piece really is one of the critical dimensions of this complexity. But also a challenge is really traceability and attribution. So can only get quote unquote credit for actions um, within current accounting frameworks 
from like the greenhouse gas protocol from a supplier that you know you buy from. And often the intervention will be a couple layers back or tiers back in the supply chain. And that's, you know, in going back within the supply chain when traceability often becomes challenging. So many investments to improve emissions might be being addressed from the same supplier from multiple companies. And so this question then about attribution and which company gets to claim those interventions towards their reductions can be quite challenging. So the greenhouse gas protocol is definitely working through some ways to decrease some of these challenges in better defining some of these issues within methodologies, but it definitely presents some challenges. And then finally, just the general overlapping and shared nature, which I alluded to a bit in that last category, but scope three represents, I think, in that overlap and shared nature, both challenges and opportunities. So reducing emissions can benefit each actor that might be in a supply chain and creates this dynamic, as I had talked about before, of potential double claiming. But it also provides some opportunities inherent in that for potential co-investment when that alignment exists. So it's complicated on the accounting side, but definitely does present some opportunities in the collective action space. So with those complexities, it's perhaps not surprising that only 15% of companies disclosing through CDP have set upstream scope three targets. And I guess the unfortunate part about that, although recognizing there are complexities behind that, the rationale for that is that, you know, without having targets in place, it's really difficult to drive towards and measure progress on scope three. Thank you so much, Marielle. I really appreciate you breaking that down into these three categories for us to understand these challenges that companies and organizations are facing for addressing scope three emissions. You know, you've hit on data collection. Some organizations have wide reaching supply chains across the world. So being able to coordinate with those communities, as well as looking at traceability. So working more closely with supply chains and understanding who could be claiming these interventions themselves. And then finally, yes, you've touched on this overlapping and, and shared nature that companies have in trying to ensure that we're not having double claims for scope three, but at the same time, encourage organizations to start tracking scope three targets as well. So all very important pieces for this scope three challenge. And do carbon credits have a role in balancing scope three emissions, which I think is the big question we're all trying to grapple with? Yes, the question du jour. It's um, a hot topic for sure in this corporate climate community right now. And for good reason. The short answer, a bit of a spoiler here, is that yes, we, Conservation International, do believe that carbon credits and particularly when we think about carbon credits, we're, we're thinking about nature-based credits, present a really important opportunity to address scope three emissions. Given the, the climate crisis that we're currently facing, we really feel that we can't afford to continue leaving this solution, the nature solution, off the table. However, we do really believe that there are some improvements that are needed to current greenhouse gas accounting and target setting frameworks to allow us to realize that opportunity. Broadly, I would say that we see the need for greater flexibility in those frameworks and, and how companies go about accounting for and achieving their targets from both a boundaries setting and timing perspective. And I'll come back to those topics in just a second, but to be able to really maximize the opportunity for carbon credits as providing a solution for scope three emissions. To understand that opportunity a little bit better, I think it's helpful to consider some of the different, what we might call use cases for carbon credits in addressing scope three, i.e. what types of scenarios might it make sense for companies to use carbon credits. The SPTI recently put out for comment and input a scope three discussion paper that I think outlines some of these use cases or scenarios well. And so I thought I'd just talk through a few of those for a minute. I think it helps make it more tangible for people who are trying to think about this space. So 
One of the use cases highlighted there that we think quite a bit about at Conservation International is the use of carbon credits from mitigation activities within the value chain to help substantiate value chain emissions reduction claims. So what does that mean? Mitigation activities within value chain. Sometimes this is called insetting as well. And this could include things just to give an example, like planting trees on a farm that is a supplier for a company looking to make reductions within their scope three supply chain. So right now, the greenhouse gas protocol and SPTI don't allow for use of carbon credits for any of these use cases for companies. And so that is something we'd like to see addressed. Some of the most active debate around this use case for in-value chain reductions is around the boundaries and how broadly we draw the boundaries for what can count. For example, within a landscape that a farm is located, that is a farm within a, a company's supply chain, how far beyond the boundaries of a farm should mitigation action be counted? Is it only strictly within the boundaries of that farm? Is it adjacent to that farm? Is it more broadly within the landscape? And from Conservation International's perspective, a broader view of that boundary is important because often some of the biggest mitigation opportunities are present at that broader landscape level. So there's some good work underway on this. Vera in particular with their Scope 3 program and also the Value Change Initiative are both looking to tackle some of those boundary questions. Another use case that is highlighted in that Scope 3 discussion paper that I mentioned is use of carbon credits to support neutralization of residual emissions. So under the SBTI framework, I know different folks have different definitions for what neutralization means, but under the SBTI framework, neutralization of residual emissions is not countable towards achieving near-term targets, five to 10-year targets. So this is a real challenge in that it provides really little incentive or no incentive for companies to invest in high-integrity carbon credits now, today. So we believe that that needs to be corrected to encourage abatement that includes credits and use of credits from day one while other mitigation actions are being pursued in parallel. So that's the second use case. And then the third is really around using carbon credits to support what we would call beyond value chain mitigation. So what does that mean? Well, these are actions as defined by SBTI, but actions that are taken outside of a company's footprint. So instead of that earlier scenario where we're talking on farm or within a farm landscape, this is really talking about mitigation actions that can be invested in it through carbon credits in another landscape that has also important mitigation opportunities. So we really see this as an opportunity for companies to address the portion of their footprint that's not currently covered in their target boundaries in particular. And it really allows for more flexibility for companies in, in being able to focus their resources on addressing key hotspots while still taking responsibility for their emissions and acting now. So in this moment where we're really seeing companies in particular struggle with addressing their scope three emissions and meeting their targets, many companies have been dropped recently from SBTI because they haven't been able to meet the targets, they've said. Carbon credits now allow companies to really take action more immediately while they're working through some of those challenges we talked about before in addressing scope three, working through things like supplier engagement and change management and building coalitions with other companies. So, you know, the current paradigm of frameworks and standards isn't incentivizing use of carbon credits to help address this near-term problem. And that's why we think it's really important at Conservation International to support an evolution of the standards landscape. That is all so fantastic. And you've really helped paint this picture of the complexities of Scope 3. But something that you mentioned, Marielle, is that Nature solutions cannot be left off the table. And right now, being able to utilize carbon credits as a financing mechanism, which also right now we're building high integrity within the voluntary carbon market, is really important. And you've 
given us these valuable use cases to help demonstrate the power of utilizing carbon credits for scope three and moving forward, hopefully being able to see this greater flexibility among the frameworks that are setting sail for how we're tackling this issue, but looking at how we are addressing this boundary and timing question. So I appreciate you walking us through that. And you've touched on some of these challenges. So I'm hoping we can dive a little bit deeper into that in what are the biggest challenges and criticisms facing the use of carbon credits for scope three emissions? And alongside that, how can the voluntary market help address these concerns? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I would say the number one challenge that we've seen over the last few years is really surrounding being able to ensure supply side and demand side integrity for carbon credit. So what do I mean by that? Well, there are concerns, very important concerns that companies might, in using carbon credits, rely too heavily on them instead of directly reducing their own emissions. And so we often hear that articulated as well as the potential for poor quality credits that don't either represent real emissions reduction or otherwise, and really a risk around greenwashing to that effect. The critics would argue that relying on carbon credits can create a false sense of environmental responsibility and delay necessary changes in business practices within a company's value chain. So regarding how the market can address some of these issues around credibility, First, I think it's important to point out that with respect to the critique of over heavy reliance on carbon credits for decarbonization, there have been a couple really important studies that have come out in the last few years that have found that companies using carbon credits actually go above and beyond when it comes to directly reducing their own emissions further than companies that don't use carbon credit. So it sort of debunks that critique that companies that rely on credits might be delaying action and in fact shows the opposite, that they tend to be leaders. So while we're sorting out the complexities that we just talked about, carbon credits, we really see in particular nature credits as one important way to act now to reduce emissions. And there are some really important initiatives, I think, out there as well that have come on the scene that are helping to bring greater credibility to this space too. So on the project side, the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market, or ICBCM, has been working to review and accredit only high integrity project standards. So that initiative really focuses on high integrity projects from sort of a governance, sustainable development perspective, as well as carbon impact. And there are also some initiatives on the corporate demand side and use side, like the Voluntary Carbon Markets Integrity Initiative, or VCMI, that has come out over the last few years with their claims code, which provides a really good starting point, especially in their foundation criteria in their that as a prerequisite for a company making any claim with carbon credits lays out what must be in place in terms of corporate commitments and action from scientifically aligned targets through to demonstrated progress. So I think there are some really important things that are in the carbon markets, the voluntary carbon markets now to help address some of those integrity issues that have been flagged and critiqued in the past related to carbon credits and corporate use. That is all so fantastic, Mariel. I really appreciate you giving nod to these initiatives underway right now to help address this integrity and scale issue that we're seeing for carbon credits and hitting home on the fact that carbon credits are enabling us to act on climate action now. We can't wait, and they are a critical tool for us to be able to finance interventions to address greenhouse gas emission reduction. And we at the Reserve are a proud approved CCP eligible program for ICBCM. So trying to continue to back this move in the market for supporting high integrity and ensuring that Companies know that the credits they're sourcing are of the highest value in the market, which is 
hopeful to address some of these concerns and challenges, especially around scope three. And looking ahead, how do you see the use of carbon credits for scope three evolving? And what potential innovations or changes do you anticipate in this space? Yeah, great question. Well, I think that what we are already starting to see, and I hope continue to see moving forward, are a few things. One is convergence. So while this space is dynamic, sometimes I feel like I get whiplash trying to keep up with all of the developments. We do see a lot of positive signs of movement towards convergence and alignment between a number of the key frameworks. VCMI, I've already mentioned, in alignment with SBTI and the DHG protocol being a few examples. And we really hope that that continued focus on trying to converge and align these different standards will help clarify and simplify the landscape and case for companies for use of carbon credits with a really sharpened focus on high integrity. I think that, and hope this continues as well, we, we are seeing some movement towards more flexibility and increased openness to being more flexible in a use of carbon credits, particularly for scope three, both with the, the paper I mentioned coming out from SBTI and also a scope three standard or beta scope three claim, as I believe it's called, having recently come out from the VCMI. And so I think that we are seeing some increased flexibility that I hope will continue on the horizon. And then finally, I think that we are seeing some recognition and I hope this continues with the very important role that nature plays in the opportunity that it provides to address more flexibly scope three emissions and corporate emissions more broadly within some of the key standards and frameworks. And, you know, we really hope this trend continues because science tells us it's really mathematically impossible for us to meet our global climate goals without nature. Nature is a proven solution, but currently is a real financing gap, as I think you alluded to previously. So we really are hoping that these shifts in frameworks continue and that create greater incentives for investment in this important part of the climate change solution space. Absolutely. This is such an important piece here in that there is a strong community coming together to align ourselves around these frameworks to simplify the process for companies to understand and navigate the complexities of credits in the carbon market, but really with this end goal to do the good work that we're all trying to do to fight climate change. So I appreciate you helping us understand why this notion of flexibility and openness and alignment between frameworks is really key here. And with these organizations, it's a lot of meeting of the minds from all different walks of climate sectors. So taking a step in a different direction, how might you see future regulations impact the use of carbon credits for scope three? And do you foresee stricter standards or more formalized frameworks emerging at the national or international level? Yes. Great, great question. And the short answer is yes, we do see a trend towards more regulations in this space, pushing towards greater disclosure on greenhouse gas emissions. And we do expect that focus to continue to increase. So in the, the U.S., we've seen a little bit of movement at the national level through the SEC rule, although only with a focus on scopes one and two for right now. But in California, SB 253, the Climate Corporate Data Accountability Act, requires disclosure of scope three emissions starting in 2027. So, so we're seeing movement here in the U.S. and also in the European Union as well, both through the CSRD, which requires disclosure of companies of environmental and social impacts, including through scope three emissions as well as the EU deforestation regulation, which focuses on seven high deforestation commodities and is requiring companies to ensure that their goods are not linked to deforestation. So although there have been some delays in that taking effect, 
I do imagine, especially with news that just came out yesterday, actually, that we're currently failing to reach global deforestation goals, there's likely, in my opinion, to be a renewed focus on ensuring implementation. It's pretty stark information coming out that we lost almost 6.4 million hectares of forest last year, which is blowing us through our annual goals to stay on track for 2030 targets and halting deforestation. So, and a lot of that deforestation to bring it back to scope three emissions is driven by activities that are part of companies scope three emissions profiles. So I think that that deforestation piece of things is really important to watch as part of the broader regulatory landscape. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much, Marielle. This is really important to uncover here as regulations are helping to tackle this disclosure on greenhouse gas emissions and you highlighting the issues that we're facing around deforestation right now and seeing how scope three is a mechanism to try and support this so that next year we're not blowing through that as well and not addressing deforestation on the scale that we need to. And being able to highlight what we're doing and seeing in the U.S., looking at California as a champion of compliance markets here, but then also across the pond and the EU and what they're also doing to tackle this disclosure on greenhouse gas emissions. So all really important to keep an eye on for future regulations. And before we close today, Marielle, and truly thank you so much for your expertise here on Scope 3, as it's a complex topic that we're covering. I'm hoping that you might be able to share any key takeaways or recommendations that you could offer to companies looking to effectively address their scope three emissions through the use of carbon credits. Yeah, great question. And again, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk more on this important space of scope three emissions today. Well, two things I think are key as takeaways that I'd like to leave listeners with. One, there is reason to have confidence in the voluntary carbon markets. We have made incredible progress over the last few years in ensuring that high integrity supply and demand for carbon credits exists. The ICVCM and BCMI are two strong frameworks with really broad support that enable credible corporate action in the voluntary carbon markets. Yes, it's complicated. Yes, we still have more work to do to improve some of the accounting and target setting frameworks, but there are tools available to move forward credibly and to take action on scope three in particular. Another thing is act now. As previously mentioned, we have a really narrow and important window that is rapidly closing to take action on climate change. And carbon credits, particularly ones that are nature-based, provide a needed solution today for companies to make meaningful, positive contributions to mitigate climate change, particularly on the challenging space of scope three emissions. So organizations like Conservation International are standing by to support companies looking to be climate leaders and to take action today. Fantastic. Thank you so much for leaving us with this empowering message, Mario, on acting now and utilizing these credible tools that we have as part of the voluntary market to really address climate change, come together as a community, and move forward on these issues. So I truly appreciate and thank you for all of your time and expertise again today and really look forward to seeing what Conservation International is doing on the path forward to help us with this big, big topic we're covering today. It's a pleasure, Lauren. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.